Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Spring Docs Emmy FYC Q&A. My name is Camelia Shofani, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Events here at the IDA. For our blind or low vision attendees, I will provide a visual description of myself. I am a Mexican Palestinian woman with dark curly hair, light skin, and brown eyes. I am wearing a white button down. I'd like to thank our sponsors, KCRW and Variety for making this possible. Uh, this evening, we'll be having a conversation between Deadline's Matt Carey and director Joe Berlinger, uh, creator of Netflix's Conversations with a Killer, the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes. Before we get started, I would like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. We recognize the Gabrielino Tongva as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land, water, and cultural resources in the unceded territory of Los Angeles. And with that, I'll hand it over to Matt. Thank you. I'm Matt Carey, documentary editor at Deadline.com. I am a white male wearing a black hat with glasses. I've got a red wall behind me. It is my great pleasure to introduce now Joe Berlinger, the director and executive producer of the Netflix series Conversations with the Killer, the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes. Thanks for being with us, Joe. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I am also an older white guy who's going gray, has a gray goatee, black glasses, and a 16 millimeter Bolex on my black t-shirt. <laughs> That's very cool. That's very cool. Well, the, the title of the film, of course, gives us a sense of the, the central content that you had access to of these very disturbing tapes of Jeffrey Dahmer. How were you able to, um, to get access to those? You know, the guy who, there is someone whose name I have to keep confidential, but he's writing a book on the tapes. Um, he's writing a book about Dahmer based on the tapes, and he approached me to see if I thought there was a show there, um, because the Bundy tapes had done very well. Um, and I was a little dubious about repeating myself. I wasn't intending to do this, you know, multi-part serial killer exploration, because I did Gacy, Dahmer, right. you know. I wasn't necessarily intending that, but I was fascinated by the tapes because it, they involve a, a young female attorney who's who was her first job to you know to sit down with Jeffrey Dahmer and get you know information from him, and she's never been part of the story before, and I thought mm -hmm. she did an amazing job. I mean, the interesting thing about Dahmer is that unlike most serial killers, most serial killers deny, deny, deny up until their execution date. And then when they think they can get some favors out of it, they start releasing information. Dahmer was very forthright and immediately began to help Wendy understand what he did and to help identify his victims, because of course he did horrible things to their bodies. So victim identification when they came upon that crime scene was very Difficult. So I was. I, I thought there was a a reason to tell this story again because we're seeing it through a 2022 lens. Well, it's now 2023, but I did the show in 2022, mm -hmm. and and you know, and seeing it through a female perspective, giving credit to this woman, this you know, 24 year old woman who was able to glean all this information from Dahmer was was fascinating. Um, so when I heard the tapes, I thought, yeah, let, let's do this. Well, Wendy really is a, a fascinating interview um, at, throughout the three episodes of the series. Uh, and you allude to this, but what do you think of her uh, as an interviewer? I thought she did an absolutely remarkable job mm -hmm. of getting Dahmer to speak. And as she says, making him you know, comfortable enough that he would reveal things you wouldn't expect him to. It was incredible. I thought she had uh, a lot of empathy, a lot of kindness, and I think Dahmer really responded to that. Hmm. Yeah, that is, and and being so young, it's and and not having experience of that, it is amazing that she was able to accomplish that. What was it like for you to listen to these tapes for the first time? I mean, they're 
they're chilling, obviously. And yeah, it's and it's it's horrific. It's horrific material, you know. For a very long time, you know, I've delved in this kind of material, and I've had to learn to compartmentalize what's going on, you know, what you're listening to, and and your own life because they, it it can really get to you, you know. Um, so as a storyteller, I thought the tapes provided incredible insight into Dahmer um, and this unique characteristic of him actually being very forthright and helpful. You don't see that. You know, I did the Bundy tapes, of course, and with Bundy and with John Wayne Gacy, because I did Gacy tapes as well, um, both of those serial killers were, uh, you know, very unreliable narrators. So you had to separate the the truth from from the, the bravado and the false information. Uh, mm. But Dahmer was was incredibly forthright, um, and it was fascinating. I mean, I think of all three of the serial killers I did in this series, I'm most fascinated by him. Mm. You know, people will, you know, I hope not take this the wrong way because obviously I'm not condoning. Uh, uh, anything that he did, he did horribly evil stuff, but he was the most human of the serial killers in the sense that he, mm. you know, he had empathy. Sorry, he didn't have empathy. He, you know, he seemed to have some contrition. You know, he he wanted to help. He wanted uh, victims to be identified. Um, and unlike, say, uh, Gacy, who got, and Bundy, who got incredible joy out of the act of killing, Dahmer you know, he put his victims to sleep and it wasn't the act of killing that fulfilled him. It was mm. this sad need to be, you know, to, to become close to his victims. But, mm. and, and he felt by through, you know, not having the victim leave, mm. consuming the victim. Th these were ways of, of, of being close to his victim. And there's something obviously... I mean, not uh, clearly that's sick and 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 depraved on a certain level, but it's also that loneliness is also very human. And mm. I, I found again, what these guys did is horrible. There's no excuse for it. I'm not condoning it clearly in any way. But you know, he 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 showed some human tenderness towards Wendy, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. And it and it you know brought closure to these families because through his honesty about what he did, they they were able to identify all of the victims. Mm. You know, there's still a number of Gacy victims that remain unidentified. Mm. You know, there was at least some, you know, small consolation. Well, not small, I mean important consolation in that. Um, from your point of view, how would you describe Dahmer's affect? in the interviews and in, in the tapes. I mean, he's he's kind of dispassionate. He's He has a degree of curiosity almost about himself and what happened, but it's it's like he's looking at it from a distance as if it's almost not him. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly the way I would describe it. He, he, is, he is detached and almost embarrassed by his acts. And you hear him from time to time you know, preparing Wendy for what he's about to say. So it, it, it you know, mm. his self-awareness and his detachment was quite remarkable. Yeah, it, it occurs to me as we're speaking, not to be too gruesome about it, but, you know, we hear that the, essentially these kind of dissections that he did of his victims or many of them, there's a way in which he's doing that in the interviews, almost as if a person looking at a body on a table and, well, I'm going to take this out and I'm going to look at it. It's like, well, that, that yes, I did that. And, hmm, you know, it, it, it's eerily. Yeah. But Bundy know. had a similar, uh, a similar phenomenon, although it expressed itself slightly differently. He was the, the guys who, the main guy who interviewed him for the tapes was actually interviewing him on death row uh, for a book uh, in the late eighties named Stephen Michaud. And they were getting nowhere with Bundy. Bundy wasn't admitting to, to, to his crimes and he wouldn't talk about them uh, in any meaningful way. And uh, Michaud figured a way to get him to talk about it in the third person. So he was describing another person 
and then all the information came came out. So it's interesting how the different serial killers, mm. you know, deal with being confronted with the truth. Gacy, you know, wouldn't admit he did anything and blamed his victims, which is just, you know, I think he's mm. the most that that's the most despicable of all is blaming your victims, you know, mm. putting your victims in a position that made them deserve uh, the killing, which of course is absurd, but that was what Gacy was about. Mm-hmm. And in general, you know, all three of these serial killers are fascinating because they're just mild mannered mm. white guys who are the, you know, not so much Dahmer, but, you know, Bundy and Gacy were just like the life of the neighborhood or life of the party, you know, guys who people liked, they had friendships, they had relationships, and then there's this secret dark side to them. In the same way, Dahmer was a, was a bit of a loner, but people who interacted with him thought he was, a, you know, a sweet guy. Um, and so, so it's fascinating to deal with this particular era of serial killers in the late 70s, 80s, and early 90s, because there was a particular kind of serial killer that just, you know, operated in society unnoticed or had relationships in an era where police departments didn't communicate with one another. Forensic Mm -hmm. evidence was not, you know, DNA technology didn't exist. Police departments, you know, barely cooperated with each other. And a lot of these serial killers preyed upon marginalized communities um, at a time of extreme homophobia and and racial bias. And I think that's that allowed Dahmer to flourish for years. Yes, that's really explored, I think, in an important way in, in your series of the failings of uh, the police in Milwaukee to adequately investigate. And there was a horrifying incident of a 14 year old boy who was put, you know, just trotted back into Dahmer's apartment. And I wanted to ask you about that, of what, you know, this case says about race in America, because not all, but the majority of Dahmer's victims were people of color, many of them African-American. But but not all African American, but but clearly he operated in these kind of margins, um, exploited that. In a way. Yeah, I mean that's that's what allowed him and Gacy in particular to flourish for so long. Contrasted with Bundy, you know, Bundy's mm. big white collegiate co-eds, uh, college students, and as soon as those college students went missing, you know all law enforcement was mobilized. And yet Mm. in in Milwaukee, you know, these one victim after the other went missing and there was no no action on the police. And then in that one incident where he brings back to his apartment, a 14 year old victim who is bleeding rectally and delirious is brought back to be finished off by Dahmer is just mind boggling. In part because Dahmer was out on parole for another assault. And if if the police had just like done their job and ran his name in the system, Mm -hmm. they would. But I think, you know, homophobia, you know, and and racial bias just allowed these crimes to flourish. Um, We see it's, you know, there's sort of two dimensions to the racial bias. There's the discounting of the eyewitness reports or neighbors who were like, like, wait a minute, you're you're saying this kid is an adult? That doesn't make any sense. But it's also says something about white privilege. They're like, ah, there's a white guy. And he says, oh, this is my boyfriend. Yeah, we're going to believe him. Exactly. No, it's, it's, it's alarming. You know, Obviously, we have racial tensions today and we have police, uh, you know, p- police issues with ignoring marginalized communities still, which is a reason to, re- you know, to retell these stories. Mm. I was curious about how you approach doing recreations. Here, you um, hired actors, you know, one yeah. to play Dahmer, one to play Wendy and and some of the prison guards. But can you describe your overall approach to, to yeah, how you I mean, it's, keep them in casting? 
Yeah, it's funny that, that I've I've embraced recreations in the last you know decade of my career because I started out as a as a cinema verite, Maisel Brothers disciple work, work you know apprenticed with the Maisel Brothers for the first five years of my career. Uh, they would be horrified to know that I'm doing recreations, <laughs> but you know it's important to me in telling these stories. And again, I hope people don't take this the wrong way. I think it's important to show the humanness of these people because I think it's a false belief we have that serial killers operate as monsters 24-7. You know, we have this image of the serial killer as this, we, you know, we want to believe that the serial killer is evil and horrible looking 24-7, that they emerge mm. from the dripping with blood from their fangs and the truth is most people in this world who do evil are the people people you least expect and most often trust and so for me it's a cautionary tale that you have to understand that there are people in this world who are sick in this way and who present themselves as normal human beings so the goal of the recreations uh, particularly in the Dahmer show different you know different i have different recreation approaches for the various shows but for Dahmer, i wanted to really bring to life that that wendy patricus and jeffrey Dahmer relationship to show that human connection to to make people understand that this is a a, a sick human being not a monster who operates like a monster 24 7 because that's the only way we can start to understand this phenomenon. You know, America ha ha has 68% of the world's serial killers, and we only have 5% of the population. So there is something mm -hmm. that has made our country, you know, the very, you know, serial killer prone. And why is that? What What is it? And, and if we can understand the warning signs maybe we can prevent this from happening in some people or maybe people can see this urge in themselves and and cry for help because you know it was nine years between Dahmer's first and second kills and he really tried to suppress that feeling and in those nine years there were a bunch of warning signs and if there were people in his life you know he was in the he he, he dropped out of college he failed in the military he didn't do well in his first job there were signs along the way and he might have been able to get get some help um so the recreation approach is to show the three-dimensionality mm. of these people because to think of them in a caricature sort of way i think is is dangerous you know in fact one of the reasons i wanted to t do these stories all three is I remember uh, I had two, I have two daughters. Uh, and at the time they were college aged and we were sitting around the table around Thanksgiving of, I think 2018. Um, and I was about to, I was thinking about doing the Bundy tapes. And I asked both of my daughters, do you know who Ted Bundy is? And neither one of them, they're mm. very bright young women, Neither, neither one of them knew who 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 Bundy was. Um, I said, yeah, check with your friends, you know, see if they know. And most of their friends did not know who Ted Bundy was. Mm -hmm. hey, that gave me a reason to tell these stories again, because the lessons of Bundy, of Dahmer, of Gacy can't be repeated enough for a young audience, which is just because somebody looks and acts a certain way, it doesn't mean you should trust them, you know, and it's it's kind of a cautionary tale. You know, so it makes me think of the BTK killer as well, who was like a church going family man. And in fact, was ultimately caught by using a computer in the, you know, his church that they traced back to him. So it's, uh, you know, that's a horrifying disconnect between this ostensible ordinariness yeah. of a person and then the heinous and, and twisted nature of their crimes. I'm curious about the question of evil, which inevitably comes up, comes up in this series a lot, um, and and where you fall on that in the sense of, you know, there's the struggle to explain what is ultimately unexplainable, probably, <clears throat> and some people resort to, well, it's pure evil, 
to me, that's always been a bit of a mask because the, the conversation ends there. Who say evil? Well, what can you do with evil? It's a it's a amorphous force that cannot be explained, but it doesn't really lend a lot of insight. You know? yeah. And I wonder from your point of view, having explored this a lot, whether yeah. I, I, I agree with you, like writing it off as evil, I think, does a disservice. And also people who say we shouldn't tell these kinds of stories. Uh, you know, I see a relationship between those two phenomenon because mm -hmm. this, uh, unfortunately, serial killing is part of the human condition. Doing bad things to other people is part of the human condition. Um looking the other way when something terrible is happening, like in Nazi Germany, most Germans, you know, really did know what was going on. Um, you know, there are people do wonderful things and people do terrible things, which is why I think we need to tell these stories and, and why the criticism about not telling these stories, I, I scratch my head over. I'm, of course, you have to do it responsibly. You have to, you know, think about the victims, of course, um, but, you know, greed, love, ambition, killing, I mean, these are all part of the human condition. So why do we say we can't tell these kinds of stories? It's, it's part of who we are, unfortunately. Mm. You've done films on many different subjects. I interviewed you a number of years ago about your wonderful documentary about Paul Simon returning to South Africa. Yeah. Uh, in the context of the Graceland album 25th anniversary. But you are a pioneer, certainly in what has become known now as the true crime genre. This may not have, <laughs> at the time, you may not have thought, yes, let, let me go yeah. ahead and <laughs> pioneer this. Yes. But I, I wonder, <laughs> you know, you I mean, uh, you know, it's funny when people say that, that's become kind of like, you know, it's very, I can understand why people say it, but I, I I think of myself as a social justice filmmaker who also um, loves music and occasionally does a music film. And most of my time in the crime space has been not about serial killers per se. In fact, that's quite new. I mean, I, most of my work is about wrongful conviction. Of course, I did the Paradise Lost trilogy uh, that helped get three innocent guys out of prison, but I, I've done a number of television series also about the wrongful con conviction phenomenon. I've done stuff that has helped change laws in prisons and advocated for victims, you know, of, of violent crime. Um, I made a film about the Armenian genocide, which was shown in Congress and helped convince Congress to finally recognize the, the Armenian genocide. So I, I think of myself as a well-rounded filmmaker, but do people do say I'm a true crime pioneer? I, I like the pioneer part because I do think I do think Brothers Keeper was a pioneering film. I was lucky enough to be part of a group of filmmakers all kind of I mean, no one was talking to each other saying, hey, let's expand the definition of what a documentary is. But, you know, Errol Morris with Thin Blue Line, which, by the way, is a pioneering film in, in true crime as well. Mm. Um, but, you know, Errol Morris was kind of inventing the recreation with a thin line michael moore at the same time as brothers keeper was kind of inventing the filmmaker as on camera you know social justice warrior jenny livingston was putting marginalized communities on film with paris is burning brothers keeper i think is is lauded as a as a film that stylistically was kind of a breakthrough in terms of its use of music and an opening title sequence and its consciousness of narrative structure so I was lucky enough to be part of a group of filmmakers in the late 80s, early 90s that really helped redefine and, and, and popularize documentaries. You know, I think the first major revolution in documentaries was, of course, inventing portable sync sound in the early 60s with the Maisel mm -hmm. Brothers, Drew and Penny Baker, but not just taking that technological achievement and just doing news reports. That technological achievement was also an aesthetic achievement of you know, uh, understanding that following a story in the present tense could be as dramatic as anything scripted. I think in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a bunch of us expanding the definition of documentary. That's what I consider the second revolution. And the third revolution mm -hmm. is te technologically driven when Netflix, you know, started funding documentaries at the scale that they're funding them and pushing it out as a global business. Um, but, uh, you know, so to reduce my career to being a true crime pioneer, you know, it kind of 
you know, I get it, but I feel like, I feel like I'm, I'm more than that, but brother, you know, I, brother's keeper was a trial film. It was the first time a trial was really put on film that I, that I, I know of. And I gravitated towards that idea because, tr because crime has perfect dramatic structure. So I was interested, my, my goal with Brothers Keeper, with Bruce Sanofsky, of course, who was my filmmaking partner mm -hmm. for many years and sadly passed away. But our goal with Brothers Keeper was to make a documentary that had all the narrative structure of a good dramatic movie, which sounds so basic today, but, you know, and we weren't the only ones doing it. But back then it was kind of a new idea and a, 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 a trial is you know a perfect dramatic that's that's why true crime has been popular as a form um because it has perfect dramatic structure a clear beginning middle and an end a protagonist and an antagonist each vying for the truth and it gets resolved at the end a search for justice i mean you could explain true crime you know its popularity as a form because it just has great narrative structure to it so you know so i get why people say I'm a true crime pioneer, but I, I think there's more to me than that, like the my Paul Simon film. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think one need only look at your credits to see the extraordinary range of films that you've done. And of course, you've worked both in fiction and nonfiction. And you made the, uh, as you alluded to, the, the Ted Bundy series. And then a fictionalized version with Zac Efron uh, playing Ted Bundy. Here, there's an interesting parallel where you have your documentary series about Dahmer and then Netflix as the Ryan Murphy series with Evan Peters playing Jeffrey Dahmer. And both were essentially uh, put out at the same time. And I think they, one fed interest into the other and it was sort of a multiplying effect. Yeah. You know, in the old days, you know, you would say, oh, we can't, we can't do a documentary and a and a scripted project on the same subject because it would cannibalize the audience. Uh, but I think we found with Bundy, uh, when people watched the doc, uh, of course, they were fed info alg algorithmically by Netflix. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people wanted more, wanted to see the scripted project. And when people watched the mm -hmm. scripted first, they wanted to see what the real story was. And we saw, you know, a lot of crossover and both, you know, there was no cannibalization. It, it just the opposite. It expanded the audience for both, which, which was cool. Yes. They both massive hits um, and both Emmy contending in, in different categories, of course. Um, in the time we have remaining, I was curious about the comprehensiveness of your series, because it's quite remarkable that you speak with so many people involved in one way or another in the Dahmer case, obviously Wendy Patricus, who's also a consultant on the series, but you're speaking with forensic psychologists for the defense and for the prosecution, speaking with uh, police investigators, uh, defense attorneys, neighbors of Dahmer, you know, witnesses. This is an immense uh, undertaking and, and fortunately, while the this these incidents occurred th more than thirty years ago now, you know many of these people are are still alive, fortunately. And yeah. but tracking them down, I'm sure, was not easy. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm very blessed that I have a great team. Catherine Park was the showrunner. Uh, Ted Schillinger uh, was a co EP. We have a you know great team, and. Um, you know, we did reach out to to everybody, and luckily, a lot of people said yes. I know there was some criticism, you know, that some of the fa victims' families were upset that Ryan Murphy hadn't reached out. But I understand that that actually is not the case. I know from uh, my own experiences, we reached out to a lot of the victims and families, and they just didn't, you know, respond. Um, you know, so that's you know that is a delicate issue. You have to. I mean, I've you know, I think vic victim sensitivity is extremely important. And I think my shows are sensitive to the victims, but it's a very, you know, it's a, obviously a very important issue. I, I've canceled pro a project, uh, you know, because the victim came forward and said, this would really ruin my life if you, if you did this. Mm -hmm. I had a movie set up with Vera Farmiga, Alessandra Nivola, Evan Rachel Wood about a a case that happened in the 70s um, 
and somebody involved in that story who had originally gave me their blessing to do it, you know, once the money was in and the cast was, mm -hmm. you know, in, uh, said, you know, if you do this, it's really going to destroy my life and I cancel a greenlit movie over it. So I can speak with authority that I'm very sensitive to victims. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think these stories are important to tell. I really do. This calls maybe for a bit of speculation, but I wonder if your sense, <clears throat> if you have one of the sort of legacy or impact of of Dahmer in this case, and in a sense on Milwaukee, it's he's kind of you know tied to Milwaukee as someone comments in in I think episode three. It's like well known for beer and Dahmer. But just, you know, uh, I, think, I, I think, you know, I don't think there's anything particularly Milwaukee in that produced a serial killer. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. you know, it's bad, obviously, that I, I think a lot of people in Milwaukee would prefer that we talk about other things. But unfortunately, it happened there. And mm -hmm. I think to prevent this from happening again, to understand that pe some people do have these urges and might be, you know, you might intervene if you if people in the lives of somebody noticed that somebody is showing signs of, of strangeness. So, you know, uh, I, I think it's a, the legacy of this case is that the police basically looked the other way because the victims were marginal from marginalized communities, people of color, uh, and, and, you know, people, of a different sexual orientation than the police would like. And uh, when those things are ignored, we see what happens. So, mm. yeah. but I don't think it's, although Milwaukee continues to have problems with its police, I don't think it's it's particularly Milwaukeean, um, you know, but I do think these are stories that we should tell for a new generation. Well, Joe Berlinger, thank you so much for joining us uh, to discuss Conversations with a Killer, the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes from Netflix. Episodes one, two, and three are streaming on Netflix. It's an Emmy contending series. Thank you for being with us for this special presentation of the IDA spring screening presentation of episode one of your series. Thank you. I, I had a great time and appreciate uh, you talking to me about it.